I'd like to welcome you to this third in our series of programs about the changing nature of scholarly communication. The first two sessions are up on the scholarly communication website. First one, uh, Stuart Schieber talking about the Harvard's new open ac access policy. And the second one, a, a really interesting panel of people talking about uh, the impact of scholarly communications and how you can measure that. Um, so if you weren't able to get to those sessions, really encourage you to take a look at the videos. Today we're focusing on the future of the monograph and asking our distinguished panel whether this endangered species will survive. Helen Tarter is the editorial director at Fordham University Press. Prior to coming to Fordham, she was humanities acquisitions editor at the Stanford University Press, where she was credited with having transformed, quote, a moderately respectable academic press into a luminous beacon of intellectual creation. Tata has worked in publishing for over 30 years and frequently lectures on editing and university press publishing. Sandy Thatcher, who we hope is on his way um, from 168th Street and will be here momentarily, uh, has served as the director of the Penn State University Press since 1989. And before that, he was at Princeton University Press, and he was editor-in-chief there for the last four years uh, of his time at Princeton. In 2007 to 8, he was president of the Association of American University Presses, and he's the recipient of their award for excellence in publishing. He's a frequent writer and commentator on open access, copyright, and university press publishing. Reedy Donato is director of the History and Humanities Division at the Columbia Libraries, and she's currently also acting director of the Burke Library at Union Theological Seminary. Prior to coming to Columbia, Re held public services and collection development positions in the libraries at NYU, UCSD, Northwestern, and the University of Chicago. In her present role, Re manages a very extensive collections budget for the humanities and consequently buys a lot of monographs. We're asking each panelist to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, as Catherine said, and we'll then open up for questions and comments. And again, if you can remember to use the mics, that'll help us for the videotaping. So I'm going to ask Helen to start. Thank you very much to the Columbia University Libraries for creating this program and for inviting me to be part of it. I very much look forward to getting back to my computer and going online and finding out what has been done and what is to come. Um, I've heard it said, um, I believe by Dick Turdeman of UC Santa Cruz, out of the findings of a system-wide committee on scholarly research and publishing at the University of California, that 80% of the cost of a book is independent of whether it appears digitally or is printed on paper. I don't know whether that's true. And if it is, how much it is a function of accounting and how costs are or aren't allocated. But I thought I'd take as my opening task today a historical one, to say something about what this money is paying for, about what one's paying for when one pays for university press publishing. And these things do need to be paid for rather than expected to pay for themselves. In the discussion period, I can refer to some of the um, suggestions and projects that are in, in train. Apart from the last phrase, that all this does need to be paid for, what I will now say will need multiple rearticulation in relationship to new media, though one should remember that these usually permeate production and actual ca uh, tasks before they simply replace objects. We hear lots and lots and lots of talks about, well, we're going to have electronic books, but what in fact happens is that copy editors, designers um, work electronically. Um, editors spend all their time on email rather than writing letters. So these I'll permeate work tasks in ways that I think don't probably get focused on as much as they could. Um, I hope that today's panel will be a stimulating contribution to all this, but I thought it might heart to s help to start from what, on the publishing side, might be taken to be the basics. And I hadn't realized until just now that I could have actually brought pictures for you of what I'm going to talk about. But it's such a precious object that I keep it in my home library because I would not know how, ever how to replace it if I lost it. Uh, once upon a time, Back in the late 50s, to be precise, at least some university presses were big buildings full of satisfyingly complicated looking machines and people with the expertise to operate them, right down to the ability to cut the dies for printing a spine. 
In short, they were the printing plant of the university. They printed the materials, such as catalogs, needed by the university. They bound books at need for the library, and they had a commercial good, printing and binding, that could be sold outside the university. And for decades, I was fielding calls from people who had gotten some you know, privately printed book done at uh, the Stanford University printing plant and paid for it. And that, of course, went into their coffers, but it wasn't really a university press book. And because of that commercial good, they didn't need subsidies. I have a wonderful brochure from 1959 that shows Stanford University Press in this light, and all those machines must have absolutely delighted an administrator's heart, particularly a male administrator. And in light of them, the very great director, Leon Seltzer, who started his career here at Columbia when work on the Columbia Encyclopedia at Columbia University Press, could, in its preface, easily refer to printing and publishing and, as I quote, mysterious arts. With the advent of computer typesetting in the, in the 1970s, those beautiful machines became obsolete. Rather than invest $3 million in recalibrating them to new technology, that university, like most, closed its university press printing, printing plant. Then the love-hate romance of computers and university presses began as a matter of outside suppliers, often multi-million dollar businesses, I was astonished to discover how much money one of our main printers makes in a year, who provide what we need in order to produce our books, their mediatic forms, without our universities having to hire typesetters as employees. Of course, when, um, Yes, they say, in those, in those days, in the 50s, the linotype people, the proofreaders, the copy editors were all actual employees of the university. And from those, that time in the early 70s, there's been, well, university presses were an early part of this sort of waves of outsourcing that uh, we see everywhere in the society. Um, and now, of course, there is the claim that the book will be replaced in forms that presumably represent still more revenue in Redmond which, as I assume you know, is the corporate headquarters of Microsoft, and represents still fewer jobs at home. Other university presses, such, at For such as Fordham, my present employer, were more virtual from the outset, as is the entire form of scholarly publishing as an enterprise. In 1907, um, I think he actually was one of the Jesuits at Fordham, but uh, someone wanted to publish his own research, and so he started Fordham Press out of uh, his living room, basically, um, somewhere on the Upper West Side, I think it was. But because it was in New York, uh, one didn't have the need for a printing plant because there were al already places, you know, pr plenty of places, this being a capital of printing for and publishing for this work to be done outside the house. Even where the University Press was conceived as also a pl printing plant, from its inception just over 100 years ago, it was from the first conceived as above all a means of publishing research and faculty research. It is an integral part of the model of the research university imported into this country from the University of Berlin at the turn from the 19th into the 20th century. And it is linked to the notion that university presses create new knowledge. Also, very interestingly, and I think this is key to the whole question of what is the monograph and is it or is it not endangered? Um, part of that model is that in the humanities and social sciences, professors become authors with all that that means capital A, starting with Milton in this society, a very complicated and fascinating question. Indeed, it seems to me the whole question of the monograph is kind of hiding the author, and the question of university presses, university professors as people who sign oeuvre, you know, works. Um, a monograph, I actually, I, I didn't bring to this particular presentation the last talk I gave when I was asked to talk about monographs, and that was at MLA, and I, um, defended the notion and looked up what monograph means. Monograph means, and my father's one of the few people who've actually written one, um, and it had a precise meaning in the 19th century, and it was a book that gave everything that was known about a particular biological species. Um, the second meaning that uh, um, Webster's New 11th Dictionary, which is our dictionary of reference, gives is, and I wish I'd remembered to write it down and bring it here today, um, it's totally disparaging. You know, a narrow book that nobody would be interested in, basically. So it is a, technically a term of opprobrium um, if you look at, at, at uh, uh, Webster's, and I don't think our authors write books like that, nor do I think our professors write books like that. Scholarly publishing, now touch just a little bit on economics and we can be um, detailed in the discussion if you'd like. Scholarly publishing is not about making money. I have repeatedly made the point that putting a price on a book, and unless one is Cambridge or Bill, Brill, one prices to the market rather than to cover the overall cost of a book. I've had the head of Sir Tony whoever at Cambridge lean forward with his very Oxbridge accent and say, we didn't realize what our books were worth. 
well, no, <laughs> I didn't realize how badly they could screw libraries. Um, but putting a price on a book is not a statement of intention to make a profit. Rather, um, it represents an openness within the institutional situation of any given university. Anyone with what is, in comparison with tuition, even for a relatively poor um, institution like Fordham, a relatively small amount of money can own a physical printed book and thus participate in the work of learning taking place at the university whose name is printed on its spine, even in faces, places physically remote from that university in its classroom. I mean, this is at the core of publishing, this obsession and delight with dissemination. And here I suspect we're maybe a little bit different from librarians um, who are, are um, possibly concerned with preservation issues more than, than we are. I mean, if somebody tears the book up, fine, they can buy another one. Uh, even within the university itself, a university press book is what is technically called a positional good. Its value lies not in how much money one can get for it, but in the rankings it can secure for its author and its publisher. And that quality of positional good extends to the remote purchaser, purchaser who by owning it participates in the university's own, uh, own positioning. The last time I spoke about books was at Michigan, and and I, I did it all, all out of markets in a book I'd published um, that was taking apart the idea of capital D, capital M market by looking at how markets actually function as a matter of particular communities. And uh, actually, there's a wonderful chapter in it on uh, show dogs, the market in show dogs, or show dogs as a market, and comparing that to literary scholarship. You know, <laughs> a show dog is a positional, it's a, a positional good. Um, it, you can't make a lot of money off it, but you've got the best dog, you can be really proud of having the best dog. And the same true of if you've got the, uh, well, as Columbia does, an English professor who was just tenured and won the Rene Wellick Award, which is the, the biggest compliment award in the country last year. But back to the question of what one is paying for in paying for a university press. For one thing, one's paying for people like me. I'm an acquiring editor. This means my job is to recognize value and create reputations, to assess, or better, to orchestrate the assessment of, um, we're very much a matter of networks um, in, in editing, the value of scholarly work and to create the reputation of a university press. From the institutional angle, that is, from the viewpoint of creating the reputation of a press, this is a matter of what I call constellation. I arrange for books to be accepted for publication and to be seen together in ways that bring out the value of each in relationship to others and one hopes make each seem more than it would be on its own. Um, I had a colleague in marketing once who said at the MLA, what I'd really like at a conference like this is to have the one book that all 10 to 15,000 people here wanted. And I said, that would be a nightmare. Apart from which, you want to be, you want, you want people to feel like a community, um, but then you'd be in the situation that Louisiana was when it published Confederacy of Dunces, and if you have a huge bestseller in your small press, it's not really great, because all your systems are strained. Um, besides, I also, that's very trade book thinking, that you throw away all the uh, um, books that don't uh, make money for the one big one that will, and you push to millions of people, and we don't think that way in university press publishing. Um, this is also a matter of diplomacy, um, this building of reputations and constellation, of using the system of scholarly communication to create a sense of community, though a community of openness, of exposure to new ideas rather than reinscription into received ones. It was back in the 80s that the very great German media scholar Friedrich Kittler, who was an author of mine, um, jokingly said that the um, university press is the diplomatic service of the university but I gather that the provost of SUNY Albany is now saying the same thing from his experience with the Naval Institute Press. But, uh, well, actually, even for institutions like Stanford and Columbia, well, particularly for Stanford, when I first started acquiring for them, it was really difficult to convince an assistant professor on the East Coast to publish with the West Coast Press. The West Coast was, well, it was a little like when I was in college in the 70s. It wasn't really quite considered legitimately an intellectual part of the country. Now, I think that's changed, but it took a lot of work. And for an ins uh, a university like Fordham, Catholic schools are sometimes seen in what I think of as anthropological time. You know, people act as if uh, theology was a discipline that happened you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, when in fact there are lots of extremely interesting theologians working right now. So I see you know, what I'm doing there, what university presses are doing, are underlying the whole system of scholarship, but also working in this task of reputation building, which is so important to universities. From the author's side, which is the more fun one, actually they're both fun, 
but uh, my friend and colleague Bill Germano once termed the editor's role enlightened interference, by which he meant working to shape an individual scholar's thoughts for a market. And he had a very, it sounded in this, this uh, essay, which I published in actually one of my books, as if he had a very strong idea that he knew what a market was, and the author didn't. However, attentive to the fact that teaching a freshman class has probably, in most of our author's experience, already been rather more effective in that regard, I gather that they just sit there and look at you like, oh, if, you, if you can't get through to them, um, I prefer to tell the story of an editor otherwise. So let me offer an anecdote. I don't have a picture, but I can have a story. Uh, the director of a major university press, at the end of a day-long interview, once asked me what sort of editor I am. I was rather taken aback, since at the time who I am as an editor had been attested to by an international letter writing campaign of many months. But I guess that meant that the, well actually it was quoted to my embarrassment, somebody really did, and I was terribly moved <laughs> by many, many things like what was quoted were said. Um, but the director's background was in the sciences, and so one sighs and understands if one's in the humanities. I told him about an author formerly at his own institution, uh, that of the, that university press, whose major book I had encouraged for more than a decade, from brilliant pilot article finally to publication at 484 pages. Um, we did manage to conceal in the title that this referred to only five years of the major author's life that he was discussing. It was a very fine book, however. During this time, I had been about as interferential, in Bill's terms, as I could manage, offering the author repeated sets of comments on his drafts, copying the, uh, editing the book myself, and sending him a 40-page memo of comments and suggestions with the editing. Uh, when the manuscript finally returned from his review of editing, with a delay of many months while the package languished in the warehouse because the author hadn't put my name on it, with the result that it was taken to be returned mar merchandise, I didn't realize until I wrote this out yesterday morning, hmm, that's a little the operations of the subconscious here. Um, I, I shortly realized that the author hadn't read a word of my lengthy and sympathetic memo, which of course I had spent many, many hours on. How deflating, said the major university press director at this point. No, we haven't reached the end or even the point of the story, I replied. Once the book was published, the author wrote me a very beauty beautiful letter offering gratitude on first seeing the book, to me above all for simply being there, asking him year after year about his progress on him, making him feel that he was an author. Um, another author of mine, Judith Butler, has given this function to me in a book done at Fordham in the following terms, which I find very moving. Um, and I quote her, if I am to give an account of myself, it is always to someone, to one whom I presume to receive my words in some way, although I do not and cannot know always in what way. In fact, the one who is positioned at the receiver may not be receiving at all, may be engaged in something that cannot under any circumstances be called receiving, doing nothing more for me than establishing a certain site, a position, a structural place where the relation to a possible reception is articulated. Um, I just couldn't believe it. You know, I was editing this cross-legged with my cat in my lap in the morning, and this is what I have said about being an editor for decades and decades. Um, Judith is describing the basic situation of any human being, but it, it's a very beautiful um, description of the structural position um, in which the editor is. And, and this opens, again, the whole question of what an author is. Why should giving an account of oneself be part of what one is asked to do as a humanities professor? Um, that goes into the very notion of a professor in the strong sense of one who professes, you know, who, who witnesses, who gives oneself to um, a discipline. You know, what does that have to do with books? It's really interesting and, and um, actually endangered at the moment, given the for pro rise of for-profit universities uh, question. Uh, quickly, since my time is drawing to a close, I have always said that the decision to publish a book is the decision to give to it the work of various other people, copy editors, typesetters, designers, and still others. The status of these heirs of the people pictured in the 1959 brochure is probably what it most, is, is probably most at stake in today's discussion of the future of scholarly publishing and of the monograph. You know, are you, is it really going to become a book in the sense that all one pays for the time of these other people to be given to it. Here, if invited in the discussion, I could offer long digressions about the gnomes of Redmond and how they create a false sense of freedom while concealing yet, yet intensifying the ways our intellectual production, in fact our very lives, are bound into mediatic social networks, while also enriching to absurd ex extremes those involved in propagating the medium, the medium of the computer via endless campaigns of planned ab obsolescence. 
And I might say, while those involved in the traditional skills of publishing, such as copy editors, hover on the verge of financial ruin, though now we all do. Um, but we've known this was coming in publishing for, especially people in California, for some decades. Um, in short, in a complex technological dance, Microsoft tries to offer you freedom from the whole social system of publishing. It always looks like you could all do it yourself, and then we have to pay someone $25 an hour to undo it. Uh, I remember with intense annoyance coming across a little line on the part title that one of my um, you know, translators slash editors had done. And I finally, I couldn't figure out how to get rid of it, and I tried and tried, and I finally just said, you're younger than me, you have to figure out, and why on earth did you put it there in the first place? The, one other thing about computers is people never read instructions anymore. They futz. And so you give them careful guidelines saying, please, for God's sake, don't use any of these format things that, you know, just how to do it, and nobody reads it for a second. And then, of course, you have to pay a copy editor to get, get the manuscript the way you want it so that it can be cleaned up and then typeset as a book. I see Desmond can comment on that. <laughs> um, but spell checks are no substitute for proofreaders, though they often catch things that proofreaders don't. Um, and the covers created by tra trained designers in multiple subtle ways go far beyond what any author could create on her own. And we see that all the time. And authors will come with a great idea, but uh, to really know typography, it, it looks different. It looks like somebody's spent time on it. It looks like it's removed from you into a realm of social value. That's what publishing is, which is what I'm about to say. Um, and then there's the whole question of publication, of making public, in short, of marketing. The inquiring editor's work of constellation, like the author's work in simply writing the book, comes to completion in all that a press does, and it is work by trained professionals that must be paid for. Um, designers make about $75 an hour, I wish I did, um, in creating catalogs, ads, postings on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, figuring out how, what discount is necessary, since I see a marketing director in the audience, to get Amazon to, um, you know, do their little, well, if you buy this book, you could buy this book with it. I, I don't know, but somebody figured it out, and it's really important in publishing books. Um, this, all this work finally pulls the books out of the nooks and crannies of the author's imagination and anxiety and fear of tenure and promotion issues, and presents it with full fetishistic aura, um, quoting Marx, or phrased in positive terms with the patina achieved by the polish of many hands as a commodity of positional good. I haven't here even attempted some of the bridging to digital media, although I've gestured a little bit, though media history is actually a favorite topic of mine. But let this be an opening gambit, and I'm sure you want to listen to someone else by now. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's great to be back at Columbia again. Um, my father actually graduated from Columbia University in 1918, and a classmate of his was Oscar Hammerstein back in those days. You have a more recent... Uh, graduate who's gained some fame, uh, Barack Obama, and I happen to share a birthday with him so I can claim some connection there. <laughs> but I actually spent a year in graduate school here in uh, philosophy, 1965 to 1966, and perhaps the highlight of that experience was a seminar taught by Joel Feinberg on the theory of responsibility, and a fellow graduate student in that seminar was Derek Parfit. And uh, those who know Parfit, will appreciate that the, the rest of us in the class simply sat back and watched Parfit and Feinberg go at each other in this uh, so sort of high-level pyrotechnic uh, intellectual exchanges, and it was, it was quite a treat. But that uh, that's, sticks very much in my memory of my experience at Columbia. Um, I just came, and I'm sorry to be a little late, from a AUP um, board meeting in Philadelphia. And uh, yesterday we spent about three hours um, engaging in what I might call the hermeneutics of the Google settlement. And uh, as, as I'm sure Kenny in the audience knows, is there's a 353-page document which we're all uh, working our way through. And uh, those of us in the AUP who feel some responsibility for interpreting it for the, the, the rest of our colleagues uh, are going to be spending the next several months going through it all line by line and trying to figure out what it all means. Um, but I start with that because uh, what I'm going to try to do here is actually um, distinguish between uh, what I would call the digitized book, which is what Google is all about, the whole Google Library project, the Google Book Search program. That's all what I would call the digitization of existing print books. Um, and contrast that with what I will call, the, uh, for convenience, the digital book. And the digital book is, I think, perhaps best exemplified by a project that was based here right at Columbia, and that's uh, Gutenberg E. 
and I thought it might be appropriate today to actually talk about that project um, and to really distinguish it from the, the economics of the, the digitized book, and contrasting it with the economics of the digital book. Because I think the digital book is, in interesting ways, um, the potential future of, the, of publishing scholarly monographs, but it involves huge challenges, um, as the Gutenberg E project discovered. Um, but, and I, I've actually written an article about this, which will appear in the January, February issue of Against the Grain. I haven't finished it all yet, but I'll kind of give you a preview of that. Um, and what I'm integrating into it, uh, I, I started out with the, uh, the Mellon Report, annual report, which came out in July, where Don Waters and a colleague of his there um, talked about various of the Mellon projects. And uh, what they said about the Gutenberg E project um, disturbed me because they talked about it in terms of mostly a failure in con contrast with um, JSTOR, which is you know the, the jewel in the crown of, of the Mellon Foundation's project, and uh, secondarily also um, well thought of there is, is Project Muse. Of course, both of those were focused on journals. And then they have the Gutenberg E project focused on books, which they considered more or less, you know, only a modest success at best. And part of the reason for that is that they, the, the chief criterion which they, uh, by which they judged it in that Mellon report is uh, economic sustainability. Well, it happens that I was on the, the uh, committee that uh, advised Robert Darton about setting up this um, project in the first place. So what I've done in a post-mortem on the Gutenberg E project is to go back and look at what those of us talked about before the project ever got off the ground. Now it happens that Kate Wittenberg, who was the person who actually managed the project for Columbia, the, the press and the libraries, um, actually has written her own article about this, which will appear in the January, February issue of Learned Publishing. And we exchanged articles. And it turns out that the ours are very complimentary, because what I do is concentrate on the background. What she does is concentrate on the actual lessons learned, what, what happened in the project, and, and sort of what conclusions you can draw from it. Um, and, and my take on it really goes back to the, the talks we had at Princeton University Press, uh, well, really beginning in the early 1970s, when um, the director, associate director, and the, um, uh, another colleague there wrote a series of articles for Journal of Scholarly Publishing about the crisis in scholarly communication. And there were three, three articles there, and, and they were quite influential at the time, kind of recognizing that we really had problems with publishing monographs. And at Princeton in particular, um, I was the acquiring editor for Latin American Studies, among other fields. And Latin American Studies was one of the fields which we began to call an endangered species. And I think that term really originated with Herbert Bailey, the director there, who previously been a science editor to the press. And I think he liked to think in those kind of biological terms. So uh, we, we t talked about these endangered species and began discussing them with uh, the people at Mellon. Uh, Jack Sawyer was the, the president of Mellon at the time, and, and Herb Bailey, and he um, talked quite a bit. Um, and then after Jack Sawyer stepped down, um, the person who became the president of Mellon was Bill Bowen had been president of uh, Princeton, of course, and had sat on the, uh, the board of trustees of the press and, of course, had had a lot of contact with the press. So we had talked these issues through with, with Bill Bowen extensively, with Jack Sawyer before him, and with Robert Darnton. And Robert Darnton had uh, been a uh, member of the editorial board at the press, and I had had l many luncheons with him to talk about these issues um, over, over time. And he was particularly interested, not just because he was a scholar, but he was a scholar of book history. So naturally, he took a special interest in sort of the future of the book, because he st had studied the past of the book all the way up to that point. So he, he had a special concern as a scholar in these issues, as well as just uh, you know being a sort of representative scholar in general, concerned about um, the fate of the monograph. Um, and so we, we, we talked about these issues over a period of time. And uh, you know, I, I think Darton learned these lessons pretty well. And he, at, at the, uh, early in 1998, he um, summarized the plight of the monograph in, in, a, in a letter that uh, he uh, sent out, which was kind of an early draft of the proposal for Mellon. And in this, he said, um, three interlocking problems bedevil our profession. The skyrocketing, skyrocketing price of journals has decimated library budgets and produced a disastrous drop in purchases of monographs. The drop in demand from the libraries has made universities cut back drastically on the publication 
of monographs and recent PhDs are finding it fiercely difficult to advance in their careers by converting their dissertations into books. So that was his quote. Um, I said, with allowance for certain rhetorical flourishes like decimated, disastrous, drastically, fiercely, um, difficult, uh, which were Darton's own invention. Um, this was a nicely succinct description of the pattern that the ARL had documented statistically for many years to show the, the baneful effect of the spiraling uh, STM journal prices on the purchases of monographs by ARL libraries. And that, uh, you know, that, that graph that the ARL updated from time to time was, you know, it's, has become a classic in the field as demonstrating that relationship. Um, it's very interesting also now in, with, with Darton's uh, ascension to the, the head of Harvard's library, you can, you can sort of see some of the, the roots of his thinking here, and in particularly his sort of passion for open access. Because in this original proposal, um, Darton in fact envisioned that, quote, the book should be made available to any reader without charge. Perhaps the AHA could publish directly from its office or via the HNET. Might be possible to include documentary materials as supplement of the main body of the text. And all the publication will be free. There should be copyright protection concerning the republication of the text. Well, lo and behold, of course, after Gutenberg e-project was winding down, what happened? They turned over the, 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 the electronic files uh, to the Columbia Libraries and they're available free. So, I mean, the, Darton's original idea for this, in fact, turned out to be the end result of the project after having gone through this whole process of trying to build a sustainable economic model for publishing these things. Um, and I say here, if, if cost recovery is a no media concern to Darton, then what would motivating him in proposing Gutenberg? One hint comes from this section of the original proposal, quote, principle behind the prize would be to sanction electronic publishing by showering the winners with so much honor that tenure committees and academic administrations would sit up and take notice. If successful, the example would spread and help change the rules of the game in academic life. It could also promote scholarly communication of a new kind at a time when publishers and librarians are perplexed about how to take the first steps in the difficult and dangerous field of electronic publishing." End quote. Alas, Darton's strategy underestimated the entrenched power of traditional academic practices, and as Mellon's postmortem observes, this aim of the project was never realized beyond a very limited extent. The e-books were all but ignored by professional review media, and few of the authors gained tenure or even got on the tenure track. I might say that the AHA's own post-mortem report um, is, is a bit more optimistic on both those counts. In fact, the AHA report says that two-thirds of the uh, 35 authors whose books would be published under the Gutenberg e-project have, uh, uh, have either gotten tenure or on a tenure track, so, which is not, which is actually a little better than the average in the field according to the AHA. Um, what was particularly interesting to me in, in this is that uh, in, in our luncheon discussions, I had uh, mentioned an article that I had read uh, by Cornell librarian Ross Atkinson. It appeared in the College and Research Libraries in May 1993. It was entitled Networks, Hypertext, and Academic Information Services, Some Longer Range Implications. And there, what he elaborated was, was a whole new model for taking full advantage of the electronic technology to publish a new kind of book. And uh, you might even not call it a book, but, but his idea was uh, what he used the term to describe as concentric stratification. This is how he described it. Which might consist of a top level that would contain some kind of extended abstract. This level or stratum would then be connected to the next level and so on. Each succeeding level would contain the information in the previous level, but would provide in addition greater degrees of substance and detail. Scholarly communications that would require an extended context and would therefore deserve a monograph in the paper environment would in the online environment merely include more levels than would a communication that would in a print environment have been published as a journal article. So as hinted here, Atkinson um, sees electronic publishers and breaking down the dichotomy between monographs and journal articles, and he also sees reading shifting from a linear form to something that is done, so to speak, in three dimensions. This, these are his words again. First, one can read horizontally or linearly within any level of a given publication. Second, one can read vertically or hierarchically through the levels of any particular publication. And third, one can read referentially back through the constituent citations, be these explicit or implicit, into other texts on the network. End quote. It struck me that this approach could open up wonderful opportunities to make available often esoteric research to a variety of audiences ranging from lay people and journalists, 
wanting basic information about new research results in down-to-earth language to highly trained specialists who want every last detail, including references to data on which the results reported are based, and everyone in between. And if this were to become the future path of scholarly publishing, I could readily envision roles for university editors, reference librarians, and public information staff, not to mention computer experts to play in creating such multifaceted, multi-layered documents. Well, now if that language, or that description seems uh, somewhat familiar to you, it's no accident because in March 1999, Robert Darn wrote a, a now classic article called The New Age of the Book for the New York Review of Books. And this is his description um, of what he thinks the ideal monograph would be. Um, I'm not advocating the sheer accumulation of data or arguing for links to data banks, so-called hyperlinks. These can amount to little more than an elaborate form of footnoting instead of bloating the electronic book. I think it possible to structure it in layers arranged like a pyramid. The top layer could be a concise account of the subject, available perhaps in paperback. The next layer could contain expanded versions of different aspects of the argument, not arranged sequentially as in a narrative, but rather as self-contained units that feed into the topmost story. The third layer could be composed of documentation, possibly of different kinds, each set off by interpretive essays. A fourth layer might be theoretical or historiographical, with selections from previous scholarship and discussions of them. The fifth layer could be pedagogic, consisting of suggestions for classroom discussion and a model syllabus, and a sixth layer could contain readers' reports, exchanges between the author and the editor, and letters from readers who could provide a growing corpus of commentary as the book made its way through different groups of readers. A new book of this kind would elicit a new kind of reading. Some readers might be satisfied with a study of the upper narrative. Others might also want to read vertically, pursuing certain themes deeper and deeper into the supporting essays and documentation. Still others might navigate in unanticipated directions, seeking connections that suit their own interests or reworking material in the constructions of their own. In each case, the appropriate text could be printed and bound according to specifications of the reader. The computer screen would be based, used for sampling and searching, whereas concentrated long-term reading would take place by means of the conventional printed book or downloaded text. Um, so obviously there's, there's a real genetic connection between these ideas. Um, uh, when I talked to Bob about this and showed him the draft of this, he, he said, yeah, I'm, I simply forgot you know, that this article was there, and obviously he did elaborate it and, and give some more nuances, and, and in following in his own research, he is in fact publishing a book on, uh, you know, publishing in France, which is, you know, another iteration of his, of his uh, career project, in which he's going to produce this kind of multi-layer document. I think Oxford is publishing it, but it's, it's getting close to completion, and he described it in fascinating terms in, a, in the Gutenberg lecture he gave a few years ago the Gutenberg Prize lecture, um, and it's, it's really going to be a terrific book, and this will be, you know, probably the preeminent example of this kind of um, new, new type of book, realizing the possibilities of the medium fully. Um, well, the Gutenberg E project, as you know, the, the, the Mellon Foundation um, actually I mean, accepted the proposal um, that had been vetted by our, our group, and um, they set up two things. One was the, the Gutenberg E project, which was, as you know, was aimed at junior scholars. Um, the junior scholars would each get 20,000 as a grant up front. They would have um, a year or more, as it turned out, a lot more, um, to revise their dissertations and turn it into this new kind of book. Um, and Columbia University Press would publish it. And the other one was aimed at uh, more senior scholars. Uh, it was called the um, ACLS History Ebook Project, originally now is mutated into the ACLS Humanities Ebook Project. And, and that was really to draw on um, uh, more senior scholars' work and to get them to, um, to develop in works of that innovative variety in, in, in their own fields and to sort of lead the way by example. You know, if the senior scholars um, would do this, then Darton figured that others would follow in their footsteps. And, um, you know, that project was supposed to have produced in cooperation with university presses um, and the Michigan Library, supposed to have produced 85 books, it's only produced, I think, about 55, and the economic success of that project has rested very heavily on the 500 or more um, digitized backlist books which presses contributed to it in making an aggregate which itself was attractive for libraries to license. Um, the, the Achilles heel of both these projects, in a way, was the small number of these new books. Um, in the case of of the Gutenberg E project, the total in the end, it was supposed to be 30, so it's going to be 35 when it's all wrapped up. 
um, in the ACLS project looks like they're, you know, they may eventually reach 85, but it's still a very small corpus relative to what's available. Um, the interesting thing from my point of view, when I went back and looked at the notes uh, about what our advisory group had uh, told Darton about this, there, there was real uh, uniform agreement of that this was not going to be economically sustainable, that, you know, there's, there's no way in which um, th this kind of process would be, I mean, Mellon actually thought that this was one way of experimenting to see if um, books could be published more cheaply online than in print. Uh, but those of us who knew enough about what went into producing these these very high-level, fancy um, electronic texts realized that the costs involved in there went far beyond what it would cost to to publish a traditional print book. Um, and and Ann Elkerson, who was another member of that committee, um, also had some some very interesting. Um, arguments about the ways in which the, the five different goals that were, the project was supposed to have were actually inconsistent with each other. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to just read, because um, I think it's such a good summary, um, Colin, what Colin Day had to say about uh, you know, what, what's involved in this kind of process and why it's so expensive. Um, so Day began by emphasizing the importance of keeping market and economic considerations in mind design the project, even while admitting that university presses have evolved to provide a unique and valuable mix of the altruistic and the economic, and that a university press, in contrast to a commercial publisher, decides to publish in scholarly grounds and then attempts to make the best economically of the work, whereas a commercial house would merely decides on economic grounds. He then went on to discuss the important value added by presses in the editorial work they perform. Continuing, he said, quote, so far, I've treated the work as though it could be thought of as a manuscript, as a linear text. However, there are many more potential dimensions to the electronic publication. And these complexities blur the distinction between the editing I've been discussing so far and the more detailed and technical issues that demand attention for the electronic publication. What is new to the electronic environment and difficult to generalize about is the work that is required not to ensure the digital elements work, but to design the publication to develop the look and feel, to exploit the technology effectively, to ensure that not just as a simple text, but in this new medium, the work is an effective vehicle conveying its message to its intended readership. This is an expensive exercise costing much more than the analogous, analogous activity in the traditional medium. It may well be that for the kind of scholarly works under consideration for the prize, the work should be envisioned only as text delivered electronically, that is, without these costly efforts. However, it is by showing the capabilities of this medium and showing them well that the prestige, which is the end objective of the whole exercise, will be achieved. Simple or complex, there remain the questions of who manages the work and who pays for it. We are, I assume, focusing on works that would not be economic to publish in traditional codex form. So the full cost of traditional publication would be higher than the likely revenue. Now, electronic publication of a straightforward text may be a little cheaper than traditional. So there is a category of work that may be viable in electronic form that is not viable in traditional form. But the category, I believe, is a small one. Carefully restricting the competition to such works, even if we could successfully identify them ex ante, would seem rather artificial, not in the spirit of the project. It would eliminate many worthy candidates that would not be fully viable, even with the modest cost savings of electronic publication. Thus, we have to plan on the basis that winners will not generate sufficient revenue to cover costs. This is certainly true if their works exploit the technology and have rich hypertextual linking and multimedia elements embedded. Again, the cost of designing and implementing such devices and checking them for reliability are significant. So I see an inescapable need for funding to support these tasks of publication. I've not mentioned the questions about controlling access, copyright, collecting payments, etc., which all raise questions about the income flow in such electronic publishing. Although I am moderately sanguine about the establishment of long-term solutions to all these problems, any scheme designed today should presume that revenue from the electronic book, um, using the term book elastically but excluding the repetitive subscription-based publication of the journal type, will be small. So I find it inescapable that the project will need ongoing funding not only for the prizes and the competi com competition administration, but also for the publication of the winning works. And he goes on to actually describe some more detail about what kinds of costs are involved. And in, in her uh, summing up, um, Kate Wittenberg, in her own postmortem, um, acknowledges that one of the most, uh, you know, sort of one of the lessons learned here is that the production of these works is truly a collaborative effort. It's not the single scholar going off and just producing the work. The, the scholar involved in these projects, they, in fact, they had that extra melon from money from Mellon in order to set up workshops because the 
um, scholars, once they got the $20,000, didn't know quite what to do. I mean, even how to begin. So uh, Columbia actually had workshops with the technologists, the editors, and the, the scholars all involved. And it turns out that the production of these books involved that kind of collaboration throughout the entire process, which meant, of course, that it was a very expensive process, <laughs> not just involving a single scholar, but an entire team producing each of these books. And, um, and, and, and you know, that, that really is, is kind of at the core of why these books are so expensive to publish. They, they are, uh, she has a very interesting idea towards the end of her um, uh, own post-mortem about uh, the need for developing templates so that perhaps, um, you know, publishers could sort of agree that perhaps there may be 10 templates that could be designed so, uh, so that, you know, at least the majority of these books could flow through some kind of controlled, you know, process which would uh, cut down the cost because they would, you know, have sort of set designs and set approaches for them. That kind of thing, of course, would of course be costly to set up in advance and it would take time to develop those templates, but I do think that's one possible approach to eventually keeping the cost of these projects lower than they would otherwise be because in the Gutenberg E project turned out that each each of these projects was a project all of its own, and they had to devise new approaches and do new things for each of the projects. So it was, you know, a custom-made book in a sense, and, and that is a very expensive way to, to, to publish. So I'll conclude just here by just saying that, um, you know, I, in, in my own mind, I think that the true future of, of scholarly monograph publishing in the ideal world is to produce the kind of book that Bob Darton himself is producing, but, the, the big red flag here is that I see, I see no easy way of doing this, you know, without some other kind of model which would provide the continuing funding for it. And, you know, I leave that to others to, to devise. Uh, Colin Day himself, who was so astute in seeing these things as a, uh, a, a PhD in economics from Cambridge, so he, he had a, a much um, better idea of what was going on here than some of us who didn't have that kind of professional training. So uh, we'll have some questions, I guess, later. Well, my remarks are going to be considerably uh, more informal and uh, of the observation type since I'm here um, to speak from the experience in the libraries where, yes, we are, as Patricia said, buying lots of monographs uh, still, especially in the humanities. So I don't claim to speak for the profession uh, or even all of my colleagues here. I hope we'll have a good conversation as each of you contribute um, to what we've heard today. We've heard a little bit about what the scholarly monograph is and in its print uh, format, I think we're fairly comfortable with what that represents, whether it's a single author volume or a collection of essays or proceedings. And I, I would agree uh, with Sandy that most of the ebooks that we are buying are digitized versions of a print text as opposed to a true digital uh, entity. Uh, but it still could be a monograph, whether it is print or E. So for the purposes um, of my few comments, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, reference works or other kinds of things, but what we would otherwise understand as the scholarly monograph. And I would say that um, while the title of today's panel was to discuss the future of the print monograph in light of um, digitization of scholarly communication, I would say, at least at a place like Columbia and many research libraries in academic institutions, the scholarly monograph is still valued. It, it has its place. It is a means of communication. It is recognized. It carries a lot of authority. Uh, we've heard a little bit about its place in the author's creative life, about its place in promotion and tenure. I would say it has a great place still in teaching. Uh, we in the library world uh, can observe that just by looking at our course reserves collections that we maintain on a semester by semester level <clears throat> where there is a lot of electronic material coming on board, but we have healthy collections of ink on paper sitting on shelves uh, that we hope are being used. The scholarly monograph to me and to my colleagues in the humanities areas still has quite uh, an important place in research. Uh, we see 
uh, circulation of them. We see uh, borrowing through other libraries. We see uh, the bibliographies that appear in dissertations. And so we know that uh, in the research process, our scholars are still using the monograph as well as they are creating them. And in turn, then libraries as the consumers of these monographs, I feel, are still having uh, quite a uh, responsibility and an enjoyment of collecting them and building collections and representing uh, these in our resources. I would say in all disciplines, and again, I hope that some of my colleagues in the sciences and social sciences who are here, uh, but all disciplines do still use the monograph in some form or other. I think that uh, a lot of the electronic information that we see our users come to can be uh, independent and an end in itself, but a lot of times the um, electronic drives the use of print materials and monographs especially. You might see something referred to, it may or may not be available electronically. You as the individual researcher may or may not want to take that next step and go and actually find that source, but I think in um, our academic areas that does happen a lot of times. I would say too further that um, at least in the humanities and history disciplines, there still is an expectation of our faculty, our graduate students, and our undergraduates that a library is a place to go and find the print monographic material. Um, I don't know uh, how much book buying is done by individuals these days in terms of thinking of a typical undergraduate buying their readings for their courses. Um, you, talk, you go through the bookstore, they, they still devote a lot of uh, floor space uh, to that, so there's a, there is some of that happening, but I think there is this expectation that um, libraries can serve that role by having these collections available. We may no longer have everything, or not that we ever did, but I'm, I, by that I mean we may not try to be as comprehensive as we used to be because we have good networks through our partners in the Ivy League and in research libraries across the country through interlibrary loan and other kinds of borrowing and lending services like our own Borrow Direct. But I think we still fulfill that role based on the expectation of our, our users that libraries will acquire these items and they will be available. How we go about um, buying monographs, I think in some ways that may be changing over the years. And when it comes to the print monographs, I think many libraries, as we all know in the audience, um, are reliant often on approval plans and, and other kinds of ways to make sure that we're keeping up with the current print uh, publication world. When it comes to the current electronic publication world, I think uh, libraries are still in a place where we are less um, aggressive or less able to acquire things on a title by title basis and more reliant on uh, packages of electronic materials. So if you want to think of approval plans for print materials as a way to package a lot of publications and feel confident that they're coming in, we might think of some of the uh, packages of electronic books as doing a similar thing for us to allow us uh, to bring them into our collections. I think that as uh, individual electronic books are integrated in the way libraries typically acquire things, that will be a benefit to us and to our users. But I don't think that's been worked out quite as smoothly as we would hope in all cases. I think that uh, in certain subject areas within uh, the university, not everything can be acquired in these sort of streamlined ways. And so even the print monograph, it's, it's harder to track things down uh, when print runs are shorter if you're not um, right there in terms of uh, submitting your order. Uh, things may not be quite as readily available and enter your collection uh, the way it might have once done. So we have to be, as librarians, we have to be very um, uh, active about seeing how we're going to find these publications and bring them into our libraries. 
We heard a little bit about um, the ACLS uh, Humanities eBooks database, and there are a number of other uh, databases. And again, I, I think, at least within the humanities, uh, we are not in an either-or situation in terms of the scholarly monograph, in terms of either print or electronic. We pick one or the other, and that's it. There may be some subject disciplines that we are aware of where the preference for electronic um, is there, and the need to have that print copy also on the shelf is of lesser importance. Again, I would say that in some of the humanities disciplines, maybe even in some of the social science disciplines, that not, that's not necessarily the way to go. So as um, proponents of the monograph or as consumers who are keeping its survival going, I think that's uh, one of the reasons why I would say that the print monograph is, is not completely on its way out, uh, at least within our academic environments, but it is struggling. And it's struggling uh, not because of the quality of what's being published or the amount of what's being published, but I think it's struggling based on what you heard from our earlier speakers about the pressures on, on budgets, on the press's budgets to put the resources into bringing these titles to publication and we just heard whether it's print or e, it's, it's quite uh, an enormous resource that needs to go into that. And I would say that even as libraries are looking at their budgets and portioning certain amount to serial publications, certain amount to electronics, certain amounts to print monograph, it's, it's always been a balancing act or sometimes a competing act. And I think that we're seeing that still. The complication now is we have a whole new sort of format and world to be acquiring, whether it's digital back files of journal runs or whether it's uh, current electronic books. And so that, I think, is having an impact on um, how we are able to keep up as libraries in supporting the monograph in our collections. I think that, too, my observations um, have led me to believe that uh, models for pricing coming from our, our publishers have been fairly um, known in the print world, but these models for pricing haven't always been uh, quite as understandable to us in the electronic world. So if uh, material is going to be born digital or be that ideal digital book, not a digitized version of a print book, uh, I think we have to see where those price models are going to take us and how we will be able to continue to afford to add those to the collection and keep affording to add print materials to the collection that we see as valuable. So th these were my brief um, observations based on the, the library view of where the monograph is right now. And I would say that um, within the humanities and history realm, uh, there, again, is still an expectation that this material will be in libraries. I think there's still an expectation that publishers will be out there. Uh, looking for quality material to bring to the scholarly community. I think at the same time there is an interest in moving into the area of the true digital book, something that takes advantage of all of the features and technology that's there. Uh, a question that, that I would raise as we do this is how do you maintain the life of that work over time? Because you can create something in a digital form that needs to survive. And how do you do that when the platforms change and the technology changes? The, the advantage of uh, a physical book has been that we've done a pretty good job at preserving it, at least for a long enough time, and making it something that can last and can be used in the future. I think whether it's a digitized version of a print book or a true digital book, we don't have all those answers yet. We don't have them in the preservation world. We don't even have them in the 
uh, interactive world? How will we make sure those links are still there or that multimedia still plays or that interactivity is, is going to uh, continue? So that's a, a new question that I think will take a team of collaborators and creators from the authors, from the publishers, and even from libraries and users uh, to put into that. So I would end my uh, quick observations by saying that at least in our foreseeable future, while the print monograph may be threatened in terms of its place among all these other types of intellectual resources that libraries are acquiring, it still has a valued place among those resources and will still be a desirable resource for us to continue to collect, uh, to make available and preserve. Thank you. Rebecca Kennison, Center for Digital Research and Scholarship, as most of you know. Um, I'm, I was really very uh, interested to hear the takes that each of you had from the editorial side, from a, a bit of the behind, behind the scenes, taking a look at um, what works, what doesn't work uh, from Ree's um, library side. Um, I'm a production person myself, and all of you touched on production in, to a certain extent in some ways. Um, and I was wondering whether you could talk a bit about um, how you see uh, production remaining the same, production differing, um, and where you think uh, business models for covering that aspect of the cost uh, might come into play in terms of um, thinking about whether it's a, a digitized project or a born digital uh, book, where you think that aspect of things comes into play. I, I totally agree that the editorial side, um, those, those are known costs. Um, to a certain extent, um, is there any difference in the production side when you get into electronic uh, and digital publishing, do you think? That's actually a question I had hoped somebody would ask because um, it, it's something I wanted to address and didn't have time in my presentation. Um, some of you may be familiar with this book by John Thompson called Books in the Digital Age. And uh, Thompson has the, the dual role being a, a media sociologist at Cambridge University in England. He's also a co-founder and co-director of Polity Press, which for my money is one of the top tier academic presses in uh, Britain. What this book does is provide, I think, the, the single best explanation of the evolution of, of, of scholarly publishing and as a bonus, you also get a very good explanation of the evolution of college textbook publishing, the contrast between the two, quite different business models, and a comparison between what happens in the US and what happens in Britain, because they actually work out rather differently in both of those geographical settings. But he identifies towards the latter part of the book what he calls the hidden revolution in scholarly publishing. What he means by that is the, the advent of digital printing technology. Um, you need to understand that the, that the single uh, probably most, most uh, huge obstacle for uh, scholarly publishers has been um, the artifact of, of having to use offset digital printing. Because offset digital printing meant that uh, your unit cost went way down the, 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 the greater the number of copies you did. So there was always a temptation for editors to be optimistic, to, you know, to, to expect that you would sell more because in, in, in making those projections you knew that the unit cost would come down. And that meant that uh, you ended up with warehouses full of books that didn't sell for years and years. And of course, you're all familiar with the white sales that the presses have from time to time. And that's because, you know, Everybody was too optimistic, and, and reality came to hit home, and, you know, and all those books were still in the warehouse. Well, what uh, digital printing technology did is two things. First of all, the competition from digital printers uh, compelled the offset printers to uh, bring their prices down. So it used to be in the old days that you, co you couldn't uh, print more, fewer than, say, seven or 800 copies of a monograph, because that's the lowest number that an offset printer would do for you. In competition with digital printers, they, they can now do as low as 300 copies for you using the offset printing technology. So, you know, six, seven years ago, we changed our model at Penn State Press. And what we do now is we use offset technology and, and usually do three or 400 copies through that technology to begin with, which, you know, produces the highest quality book for libraries, the sound bindings, and the whole works. Um, 
usually sells out in anywhere between six and 18 months. Um, and then we use digital printing technology to produce the paperbacks. And what it means with digital print, printing technology is you don't have to do a print run of 1,000. We actually start out usually with 200 copies, sometimes 100. And we reprint um, in sort of that range as often as the sales sustain it. Once it gets below 50 copies a year annually, we put it into what we call pure POD. Um, and that means sending it to some company like Lightning Source, which will produce books for you, you know, one at a time as orders come in. And so that's really the, the, the sort of the, the, the new economics of scholarly publishing, because it means you, you can now keep your supply much more in relation to demand. You don't have all this excess stock that you eventually have to pulp. You have much better cash flow because you don't have all that capital tied up in your inventory. And, and I think that's the single best explanation of, of why scholarly publishers have been able to survive, because we were all moaning and groaning around between 1999, 2002. Um, we know we're all, it was really bad times for university presses. And then this came along and, you know, the, the skies opened up. We all shouted hallelujah and we're, we survived for another, you know, decade or two. Who knows how long. But, but that's the key. And I think you, you need to understand that because for... The books that are still appearing in print, these books are essentially born digital because the whole processes are, are electronic all the way through to the point at which you actually get a you know, print-on-demand book or short-run digital print book. Um, but um, the, the, those digital files, of course, can you know, be fed into um, e-book readers and you know, uh, eventually mobile phones is now the, the, the new rage for the growing market for these things. So they have multiple purposes. And, and in the production side, as you well know, um, you know everybody's trying to XML everything and to you know, use uh, the, the, the open e-book uh, standards to, to try to make possible the multiple uses of your, you know, your digital content in, in all these different places. So that's a very brief summary of what's going on. Is this, yes, this is on. Um, just to say a little bit about what's up the line from printing, um, I think I tried to refer to these problems in saying that uh, before you'd have just an ebook and a different object, you have all of the um, um, procedures that people actually go through changing. Um, so that uh, uh, when edits online nowadays, um, the production is, the designers work online, all, all of these things are, you know, the computer completely um, permeates the work processes and changes them in some ways. Now, one of the things everybody knows um, um, in just our word processing, processing what's happening in a word processing is, is a process of what back in the 80s, and heyday of Baudrillard, we used to call simulation. There's a simulation of, of uh, uh, what went on in the linotype world, you know, what printing was like. That's why it drives us crazy when authors think that they're making it look like a book. I actually had authors say, the footnotes look more real if they're in nine-point type. Well, you, know, you have to put them back up to 12-point to work on them and things like that. Um, but what happens is that simulation's a really complicated procedure. I mean, what, what it simulates doesn't go away. It, retreats into fine printing. And then what happens is that um, it, it starts being picked up and used in the more real way and changing it. Um, as you see, part of this dance back and forth, the uh, presses had to close down the machines I was talking about, and we went off and used GNS in Austin. And um, you know, that's they, there were people who specialized in typesetting. And then um, maybe, I think it's within the last 10 years, people started bringing some of that typesetting back in-house um, in the uh, Mellon Foundation project that we're involved with, with some of the people from NYU Press who are currently here. It's the American uh, Literature's Initiative. Part of what's being funded is the work of an outside managing editor who's actually a former colleague of mine who specializes in both managing production and doing the typesetting himself. And so various tasks that we, ha we actually were <laughs> done by people um, from across the, the border in Mexico who didn't necessarily know English. Um, when we, GNS was the fine uh, compositor being brought in-house and, and done by, by people in-house or by people who specialize in that. There has, it's my impression, and I think it's true, that production costs have come down. And there's a lot of pressure on, on people, as Sandy was saying, to offset printers to match digital printers. There's also you know, competition from India now, although I have you know, some complicated feelings about that, about trying to, you know, do everything as offshore as much as possible. That's not new. I mean, it, it's been going on for 20 or 30 years trying to use cheaper Asian publishers. But 
it's interesting that, yes, everything is digital, but people talk about HTML coding. I actually don't know anybody who's actually done it. Um, so while everything exists digitally, the movement from that to some kind of accessible or usable platform, I guess it would be, um, I, I think there's still a certain tentativeness there. Is that, does that give you some? Columbia, Columbia is one of the first presses to do XML coding in its production yeah. workflow. Yeah. Well, my name is Kenny Cruz, and although I deal with copyright issues here, I'm not going to ask a copyright question. Uh, I, would, I would really like to hear more about your, your thoughts about the reader, and, and at the end of the entire process, what the transformation of the book means for readers, the way they acquire information, the way they may in fact actually read a book, and, and work with the information resources. What do you see as implications? I was very excited about the quotes from Robert Darton. I thought that was great. Um, I think that uh, processes of reading would probably develop in different ways on, online and in, in the print medium. Um, people, which is one of the things I had been tempted to write about, I, I don't know the full jargon that kids have with regard, and those are the, you know, the users of the future have with regard to what they do, but I think what you do is hit online. So that uh, you, know, you visit something very quickly, um, people, are very interested in searches online. Of course, that's a very, very ancient mode. It's a concordance um, of a, a, a genre of book, and the computer's a lot better at it than, than books were. Um, my husband told me this morning, uh, as I was coming here, I think it was actually in the Mellon Project he's involved in with uh, SSRC, one of the Mellon suits, as he said, uh, I don't know, I know, I have only his statement for it, so I don't know exactly where the data came from, but apparently they did some study and found that the average amount that people read online was 13.5 pages. Um, now, I happen to have to moonlight as a copy editor, and my husband works as a copy editor, and I bet a lot of these people who talk about ebooks don't have to deal with books online. Um, I, I actually happen to have been in disability for computer injuries for about eight months and was put through, you know, very many sophisticated seminars on the, what I call the other side um, in the heart of Silicon Valley, and your eyes are statistically um, where the greatest computer injuries um, occur. Um, it's, very, it's difficult. There's a problem of not blinking, and there, you can't do anything about it. Um, if you have sustained work on screens, you can't have every 10 seconds something say blink if you're trying to deal with thinking about a sentence and its structure. Um, and we, we forget about it because a lot of us, you know, write into computers and your eyes behave pretty passively when you're writing. But when you're reading, your eyes are very, you know, you get stuck to it. You also um, want to wiggle. And that's another thing, you hurt your shoulders and back by always being there. Um, so I think that, I mean, I think that, but that there may come to be a certain complementarity in reading. There's certain kinds of reading will probably be developed or returned to um, by means of electronic things. Um, but I'm hoping, I certainly hope because I am attached to this, that the practices of sustained reading, um, the efforts of imagination and whatnot that the book uh, supports. Well, I actually, I happen to every once in a while have um, a 21st century equivalent of what in the 18th century they called reading sickness. I periodically love murder mysteries. I'm a total plot addict. Um, and I could read about 300 pages in probably maybe four or five hours. If I were doing that on a computer, I'd be sick. Uh, you know, so there, it's, it's just reading something very rapidly like that is not something you can do. Um, but there are many things that you can do very, very well. Uh, I uh, have heard um, from, uh, actually it's an experiment that California is going to do in the series called Flashpoints um, that's headed by Dick Turdeman, who I mentioned in the first line of this. Um, his belief, uh, based on this system-wide committee at UC, was that uh, People wanted, in the humanities, wanted to search online and they wanted to read on paper. Um, and I, that relates to something Ree said. Um, there are a number of statements coming around from places like Project Muse or um, that, that I think what you said was that um, the elect electronic drives the use of print materials because you read different ways. You find out about it electronically, but if you want to, uh, if you want to read it for any length of time, if you want to mark it up, if you want to think with it, um, that the, all that modes of reading, you probably still do better looking at a page. I actually was really struck um, doing some reading and marking 
at my desk, and I realized, I can hear the birds. And not just which is what I listen to all day long, you know. Um, there's a kind of way in which, uh, well, you know, that wonderful Yeats line that the long-legged fly moves on silence, like the mind of someone thinking. Um, now, that may pass away. Um, there are, um, well, I'm actually extremely fascinated by the way in which mediatic changes alter modes of reading and writing. Um, but one just recognizes that difference. I will mention one amusing thing. Um, one place where electronic uh, uh, things are being way, um, are being adopted, I think, far faster even than in libraries, is in medical imaging. And uh, there are truly remarkable ways that I've been shown at uh, actually a seminar I used to go to at Stanford of how um, um, sort of virtual means can be used to simulate what surgeons are going to find. Uh, but they found that surgeons lost the ability to imagine, to project, as they had had to do in the past, um, what, what might happen when they cut, because they became more and more dependent on these. Just throw that out. Anyone else want to comment? An an another dimension of that which I worry about a lot is what I call a growing digital divide between book and journal content, because as you know, you know, Project Muse and all these STM journals are, you know, readily available electronically now. Uh, the books are not, and the books, um, you know, are maybe the Google project, you know, this new new settlement will, will change that, and it does hold promise of, of actually bringing a whole lot more book content online, because what librarians tell us, you know, you can confirm this, is that, you know, if the books are not available in electronic form, and can't be searched that way. They don't exist. So for publishers of monographs, that's a concern because, um, you know, you also want the journal literature to interact and preferably interlink with the book content so you can, you know, jump from a link in a journal article to book content, uh, not just jump from one journal article to another journal article. Um, and, and that's uh, par probably the, and, and this speaks to Kenny's expertise, probably the single greatest obstacle to getting the book content um, there is uh, the permissions questions, the, the third party rights issues, particularly with images and everything. And that's, that's a huge conundrum for publishers um, because, you know, they, they have to go back and research what rights they even have in the digital realm for, for much of the content because, you know, the contracts they have were written in pre-digital age. They don't know what rights they actually had to put this material up in digital form. And so, you know, there's a, there's a, a huge amount of work, even with the Google settlement, that publishers will have to do to find out what they can actually put up in book content. And that's going to slow that, you know, the, the digital divide is going to in keep increasing up to a point where that that problem can be can be resolved. If orphan works legislation is passed, that will you know provide another little bit of grease to the <laughs> the wheel of getting that uh, past that obstacle. I can I can just add one um, anecdote and another observation. Uh, last night I met with a class of students. Uh, these were all first year students, and I w and actually their instructor had given them Darton's article to read uh, as a way to think about how they approached the library, although the subject I was helping them research had nothing to do with that article. And as we were talking about things, um, every student in the class said, well, you know, no matter what it is, if it's over about two pages, I just print it out. I can't read. I can't read on a screen like that. And they said, it's, you know, it's one thing if I'm reading just for information or if I'm looking for something. But if I really have to read it, I just print it out. And then they launched into, and so why can't we print out more pages a week? <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, and another observation I would, I would make is, um, I think in some ways maybe people are reading more often. They're just not reading in a, in a sort of contemplative or, as you said, sustained way. Because everything, you know, if you're on a computer all the time, whether you're texting or getting emails or, you know, doing whatever, you, you are involved in the act of reading. But I think it's uh, not the kind of reading that most of us in this room think of when we say reading. So I, I'm actually surprised that the average uh, number of pages is 13 and a half. That sounds like <laughs> a lot to me when I think of a screen. But I think it will change, and, this, and certainly the device that one is reading electronic materials on is going to have a really powerful impact, um, you know, whether it's the Kindle or whatever comes next. Uh, just the way it sometimes amazes me to see people watching movies on their cell phone, you know, 
at some point. Uh, if you can get the text to shrink enough but still be uh, aesthetically pleasing, maybe we will do more reading like that. In, in terms of sheer economics, using a desktop printer to print out the pages is vastly uh, more costly than actually, you know, yeah. using a printing press to produce the paper. You, as both Rhea and Helen have pointed out, uh, read clearly and easily online. A text that is uh, designed to be linked out to other things. A text that is by uh, a textual environment that's digressive, that's almost uh, attention deprived in some ways. And that one wonders what the fate of a longer form like the monograph is in such an environment. I think if nothing else, it means that there's an enormous pressure on the publishing world to make sure that the texts that are created are something one can get into and get out of quickly and work flexibly. And to that line, Sandy raised some very interesting prospects about the speculation of the exciting things that can be done eventually with the book. But I wonder if we've not all as a community of publishers and, and librarians demanding material drop the ball in terms of getting this very large bulky form into a much more usable format. I, as head of the electronic tech service, I'm constantly working with people who are trying to use the ebook collections we have online. And the content is wonderful, but frankly, the usability is very low. And there's been a very low interest in such things as, for example, making good intelligent mining tools. Uh, supporting things like proximity operators that let people jump right into the page they need, uh, presenting, let's say, a keyword in context display so that people can see quickly what they have instead of jumping in a stately fashion from spot to spot to spot. I mean, it's clear if, if one is in a discovery rather than simply reading environment and one has pulled up 50 books that contain something one is interested in, I suspect no reader gets past the first five that contain that material. And it seems to me that some of those tasks are perhaps less exciting, but perhaps more graspable for all of us to look at right now. The ways of crafting books that will be as easy and comfortable to use online as the journal articles. And I, I can say, looking at the state of things today, that's, that's not where it is. I'm a, I'm a great lover of what's in, for example, the ACLS project but it's a very, very stately environment. It's not one that lends itself quickly to discovery, moving around and quickly handling those pages. And I think, I think there's some challenges which on one hand are urgent, but on the other hand are quite doable if the, if the publishing world will just take them on and look a little bit more closely at usability. I don't know what your thoughts on that are. Well, one of the big lessons of the Gutenberg E project is, is the inertia of the tenure and promotion system because that really drove what happened with that and, and, and helped you know, parts of it fail. I mean, they wanted to get these books reviewed by professional journals, and professional journals, by and large, refused to do them. They didn't know how to deal with these books. Eventually, they, they produced print galleries and sent notices to the review media to say, this only represents sort of one part of the book, and you really need to go to this website to review the whole thing, and the journals were reluctant to do that aside from the AHR, which had sort of a special reason to, to back the project and did some reviews of some of the early books, it, it really was very difficult to persuade journal editors to, to review them at all. And, you know, the, the acceptability, well, yeah, I, I, tenure and promotion committees, you know, more or less began to accept these, but it was a struggle. And if you're talking about, you know, this is just still identified as a book and you know there's still the articles and you're talking about some other kind of thing like Ross Atkinson talking about you know something in between perhaps or mixtures and whatever and new new creative forms what are tenure promotion committees going to say you know we as publishers cannot create these things de novo and sell them into a market which is not going to accept them so I just, oh, sorry. And one more question. Yeah. Uh, I, I find what you have to talk about very interesting. In fact, uh, while you've been speaking, I've gone ahead and purchased the book that you've mentioned. 
uh, on my phone. Uh, and <laughs> what, what I'd like to ask is, uh, you know, like in the academic press environment now, what changes are actively being made for um, new media, publishing in new media, rather than simply print? Well, the, one thing we didn't mention is, is what I call a hybrid book. And that's sort of a step in the direction of, you know, what Gutenberg did, but it's, it's, it's far from being the whole distance. And at Penn State, we have a, a romance study series which, which sort of borrowed the model of the National Academies Press, which they used for their science publications. And what we've done is put these up on the library server, open access, and it's, it's done in such a way that um, uh, the, the chapters are broken into PDFs. Half of the PDFs um, you can actually, you know, view online and, and then print out and download. Um, the other half of the chapters you can view only on screen and the, and the print function is disabled. Um, there's also a link here to, you know, buy this book and it goes to Lightning Source and provides you with a POD copy. And so essentially, you know, in, in National Academies press terms and ours, this, this serves as a kind of uh, marketing function. It's, it's, it's like, you know, look inside this book. It's just another version of that whereby people can go in and really sample the content um, and just decide about making a, a book decision. Uh, so far it seems to be working out. We're using a template design to keep the design cost down for this series. Um, the the, the uh, two, two language departments at Penn State provide the editorial, you know, uh, review processes largely for this at no cost to the press. So, you know, there's, there's certain ways in keeping the economics of it um, uh, lower than, than some other monograph publishing. But the other um, aspect of it is that we, we hope to be able to add various elements to these. For instance, um, it, with, with respect to these, we would like to provide links um, or actually digitize and put up the um, original French language editions or Spanish editions of the, you know, the texts that are discussed in the books. Um, some other projects we're intending to do, for instance, uh, data sets that uh, social scientists might create. We, you know, we want to put those up. So, you know, when you buy the POD version, of course, you're not going to get those, but they're going to be, a, you know, a link, and that will be printed in the book, so you can go to this website to get all this ancillary type of material. And it can, so it can be a full range, of, and with illustrated books, we publish a lot in art history. You could put a lot of extra color illustrations up, you know, which would be a way to, to provide a, a fuller experience with that particular monograph without having all the cost and color illustrations in the book itself. So that's, that's kind of a, a doing a, a digital book on the cheap, you know, and it's moving in that direction, but it, it's nothing like the multi-layered kind of thing that, that Darton book exists. So it, it, but it is, it is another model sort of moving in the direction and also involving elements of open access, which I think is, you know, we all feel it's important for us to experiment with and, you know, as long as the the economics can still support it by selling enough print copies, then we're happy to do it. Well, I haven't done, you know, had much direct experience with this. In fact, uh, my first um, experiment with it may be in part as a result of being invited to this panel since I've been talking about the Center for Digital Research and Scholarship about uh, possibly doing uh, our first experiments in what would be digitalized books in one case? One possibly might move a bit more toward a digital book because uh, um, it actually is the first book I've come across that's been written, although the author thoroughly intended it for, to be a uh, print book in ways that ignored the realities of the page. And so we're still working with the designers quite how to do this. I mean, she wants uh, to, she has a main text, but then she has very lengthy uh, excursies and comments, which of course she could, uh, uh, hit on, you know, just click and bring up, but we can't do that in the book because uh, the designer says, well, what are you thinking about that for? There's six pages here and you've got three lines. How are you going to link that together? So we have yet to, um, we've just be very, very, very beginnings of the discussions about how we can, how we can do this, but uh, I think it'll, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see how this develops. I mean, it probably also will, par will partly take another generation. I mean, I, I will ne never know as much about computers as people who are 12 years old, you know. And I probably wouldn't use something that was, you know, available electronically anyway. Um, I, I might say to the, uh, the previous question, here it might be helpful for there to be some kind of, of discussion collaboration with libraries um, because you can't just put, put something out there. You have to be in conversation. I mean, the uh, um, quote I, I read from Judith Butler apply, applies to all 
aspects of human life, including um, electronic ones. I was one of the first people in the humanities to have uh, email at, uh, at Stanford because I was involved with the philosophers and they were all over the Center for Study of Language and Information. I couldn't use it because no one would send me a message. You know, I couldn't think it up on my own. Of course, I'm now a total email creature, but uh, until one of them could speak my terms enough to write me a message and have me struggle to answer back. Um, and the th things with searches, um, um, I, we probably think in very crude ways about searches in comparison to people at uh, libraries. Um, when I was at uh, the Yale Library, you know, just basically filling in holes in, in people's footnotes. So, and I was immediately having trouble with searches, and the librarian says, well, leave off the last uh, two letters. You know, somebody had written down, it was a, a, a German title, and somebody had written down the, the endings wrong. But it never would have occurred to me. Um, so hopefully there'll be some moment at which uh, um, there'll be conversations here, and, and more sophisticated tools can be developed. If I could just get one last question in. Um, Sandy, you mentioned that we're all trying to digest the um, Google settlement and understand how it's going to work and, and even more what the implications are going to be. I'm just, and it, and it was encouraging to hear you say that on a modest level, uh, monographic pub publishing's hanging in there because of the ability to publish short runs and then print on demand and so on. I'm wondering if your colleagues in the uh, university press environment are feeling that the Google settlement may um, strengthen even more that ability to get things out there and um, get revenues in for monographic publishing. Well, the great promise of the Google project is, is all those out-of-print books. And the, 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 we had a very interesting discussion at the AP board meeting wondering why Google is paying $30 million to the Authors Guild um, legal team when, you know, certainly their expenses probably at maximum were not more than three million. So why do they need 27 extra million? So on the other hand, you know, there's a real burden on here for all those presses to research what digital rights they actually have in all those out of print books if they haven't reverted them to authors or, you know, if they have reverted them to authors and the authors want to take advantage of it and, you know, get them back into print this way. Um, so, you know, there's a huge amount of labor that has to go on, and, and there's nothing in the settlement that pays for that labor. So we're suggesting take that $27 million, you know, let's give it to the presses that actually have to do the labor, you know, and we'll do it, so. <laughs> okay, well, I'd like to just thank all three of our panelists for a really stimulating set of discussions. Thank you so much.